of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Okay, Mrs. Mayor, if you do the roll call, please. I will. Tom Cruise. Um, I haven't heard from him, so he may be coming late. All right. Or, is yeah, this is the one. I'm sorry. Him. You're right. He is excused. He is. So. I did get an email. It was right. seems right. like forever ago. Alex Zachary. Here. Cheryl Hancock. Here. Anita Jacosinski. Here. I'm here. Tim Meniker. Here. Lisa Collins. Here. And Gary Dunlap. Here. Okay, so with six of the seven school board members present, I would declare a quorum. Uh, board norms reflection in your folder are the board norms that have been adopted um, in February of this year. So if you take a look at those as a reminder of the um, agreed upon processes for our meetings. Approval of the agenda. I would note that the agenda has been posted, distributed, and sent to the local media. With this in mind, are there any changes to the agenda? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda as published. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Discussion. Okay, all those in favor of approving the agenda as published, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Then public participation. Is there anyone who wishes to address the board relative to any item at this time? We ask that a five minute time limit per person be followed. Please come forward, state your name, address, and a topic to be addressed. Okay, I don't see anyone, so we will move on to recognition and thank you. Dr. Carlson. Three acknowledgments and thank yous this evening. First to the La Crosse Community Foundation for uh, the recent donation of $2,250 as part of the Jim's Grocery Bag Grant. And these funds will pay, pay for meals for children um, who are in need uh, within our school district as far as for meals. Also, the University of Wisconsin, La Crosse, we thank them for their donation of $500 as part of the Cooperative Teacher Grant which will be used to purchase, in this case, an iPad mini to be used by the Holman High School's Physical Education Department. And then finally, we thank Altura Federal Credit Union for recent donation of $500, which will fund the purchase of an iPad to be used uh, by our students at the high school as part of the school store. Thank you. All right, thank you. And as usual, we recognize these folks and organizations that make Holman unique and um, help enrich the lives of our students. So we do thank you on behalf of the Board of Directors. <clears throat> District Administrator's Report, Dr. Carlson. Just a couple comments. Uh, there's a, several items here actually, but I just wanted to acknowledge that it is ninth grade orientation this evening. And I think most of us discovered that as you drove up and looked for some alternative parking so um, I note that too that our high school no, Mr. Bear is that's where he is at as well as some of our other high school staff so it's another indication of school year is quickly approaching and we actually we welcomed new teachers this morning and thank you for so many who are involved with that especially Wendy Savasky planning that event uh, and then that continues into tomorrow and then all our staff return on Wednesday for, we have a breakfast, which the board is invited to attend. That starts at 7 a.m. And then our recognition program at 8 o'clock in the high school gymnasium. And I hope, hopefully the weather is going to cooperate. It's going to cool down just in time. So we'll see. So just a couple of those. And then, of course, most importantly, students um, a week from tomorrow return. I do have a couple items that are listed under the under my report that in part it's going to be an opportunity for you the board to provide some reactions some input on some of these items and uh, some of the others are just for information at this point but happy to take questions so if I could start with 9.3 on board policy 538 evaluation of personnel the board reviewed this policy back on July 14th uh, prior to moving it to the personnel and governance committee for their review and examination and work the personnel governance committee approved at its August 13th 
a meeting to move the policy forward to the board for a first reading. At the Personal and Governance Committee meeting, two areas were discussed and suggested to bring to the board for further discussion, either prior to a first reading or as part of a first reading. I included this as part of my report as, I'm, as I and we are looking for direction um, on the board along with input as to how you would like to proceed with consideration of this policy. Two areas of interest that the board may find beneficial to discuss prior to a first reading. The first area is the requirement by statute to include in the policy a statement that outlines penalties for breach of public release of an educator's educator effectiveness summary data by both employees and school board members. For employees, the language reflects the progressive disciplinary process. And for board members, the draft that you have um, includes language provided to us by the Wisconsin Association of School Boards. The Personal Governance Committee did not feel this is something the committee would discuss and make a recommendation to the board as part of the policy. It's something that, that the board itself would need to review and discuss separate from the committee. Everything else really went through the committee and as far as the committee was concerned was ready to move forward. And I would ask at any time on this, either Cheryl or Anita or Jay, I mean, contribute to this as needed. <clears throat> the second issue is a continuation of what I mentioned to the board when the policy was presented back on July 14th related to the administrator evaluation guidelines attached to the current policy. It has uh, been at this point the administration's recommendation to move the guidelines to an assessment manual for that employee group to be consistent with other employee groups. Due to the new educator effectiveness evaluation system being implemented statewide by the Department of Public Instruction beginning this year, there are changes to be made in the guidelines for those administrators who will be on the educator effectiveness evaluation. Among the recommendations includes uh, the possibility of following the prescribed educator effectiveness evaluation cycle where the principal experiences a summer year every third year and then the other two years are called or referenced supporting years, which there are different options that can take place during that time. Currently, principals experience an annual summative evaluation and having the summary year annually or every other year or every third year is a local decision, okay? It's a local decision. It must be um, at least every third year by statute. Teachers are on an every third year cycle for the summary year. So while the Personal and Governance Committee has approved moving the policy revisions to the board for a first reading, it perhaps is beneficial for the board to have an update on the implementation of the educator effectiveness system before um, for our, both our teachers and our principals. And so that uh, if this would be helpful, we are ready and we are planning to give a presentation on an update on the educator effectiveness um, valuation implementation at an upcoming board meeting in September. And that may be beneficial for the board too, uh, moving forward with this policy. As of now, we've, we've made plans to, for our principals under the uh, evaluation system to move them all to year one for this year. Um, so nothing would be changed at this point uh, for this year. That's, that's what we have put in the works because we just, uh, because of timeliness, we need to get going on this. And so we are making plans to do that uh, for all the principals to be on that mm -hmm. summer year this year, um, along with associate principals. So I, I've given a lot, I've said a lot, but there are two main issues here. And probably for tonight, um, the one of the main ones is this, this breach, this language on a penalty. And so if you look at your draft, um, you should have that. And it would be under, um, I believe, number four. Yep. And again, this is something that the Personal and Governance Committee had not really even seen since we've worked on this even since then. 
So looking for comments, feedback, um, but the policy is something that it's a, it speaks to the evaluation of all our personnel, not just administrators, not just principals, and so on. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're looking for input, especially on the penalty at this point, and, and direction from the board. So if you look at that item, um, 9.3, uh, item number four, penalties for breach, district staff subject to the district's progressive disciplinary process. Um, I think that is, you know, very standard language. And then board members, I know we were discussing this and we were looking, the Personnel and Governance Committee was looking for some language. This is the language they received from the um, Wisconsin Association of School Boards. So if a member of the board would release, publicly release educators' data, summary data, that type of thing, this would be the penalty that the board could be subjective to. And we could include um, one or all three of them. Uh, I think as a board, we're responsible to include something mm -hmm. for a penalty in order to have the policy. Right. Um, but yeah, we we couldn't come up with language, the Personnel and Governance Committee, so that's what, where this language came from. So your feelings on this, input, thoughts, I guess that's what you're looking for this evening. Evaluation to me is always good. And um, the three items I'm seeing here, if I can't live by any of those, I should be off the board. <laughs> I really should. So um, I think that's fine. Any other? Okay. So then the next item, and this is something that um, we had a little bit of discussion because administrative evaluation guidelines were included in this policy and we're trying to make this policy more across the line. Only administrative evaluations um, guidelines were presented here. Um, the idea, the intent is to remove the guideline statements from the board policy and then be reflective in the assessment manuals. Dr. Carlson pointed out, however, that number one, um, if we follow and we look at what the new educator effectiveness guidelines are, it's a little bit different than number one. Um, it, right now, we expect our, our administrators to be evaluated every year. Um, there's a feeling that, I think Dr. Carlson explained that under the new process, a summative or a complete full evaluation would be done probably every three years with um, additional evaluations on the off years. And, and we had some good conversation about this and, and really wanted to bring this to the board because, you know, I, I felt that the board's um, opinion, and I'm just speaking for myself, was that we do evaluations every year of our administrators. I think we want to, you know, we're not really clear on what those off-year evaluations would be. And I think if we do this, we would want to assure that if there was someone who had um, a performance improvement plan in place, that they would be reviewed annually. Um, but that was just my opinion. And so I, I said we should just bring this to the board for discussion and make sure that the board's opinions reflected in whatever that new assessment manual um, does. We can do it differently when, than what the educator effectiveness process says. We can require a summative evaluation every year if that's what the board chooses. So just wanted to put that out there for some discussion. And again, as Mrs. Savaski and I talked, uh, we we think it's timely to provide an update to the board no matter what on the ed effectiveness and all the work that has gone into putting us in a, what we believe is at a pretty good place for our educators. And so that, that may be helpful too for the board to have that update as well. But um, so, so input thoughts. I guess my two cents would be that I think having an annual evaluation is appropriate. It seems as though um, three years is too long, two years seems to be too long to do an evaluation. And, and I, again, I, I agree with you, Cheryl, I don't know what the 
uh, other summative evaluation process would be on the off years, but how else do you kind of monitor that comprehensive detail of, you know, performance without that? So my, my thought would be annually would be appropriate. Okay. Yeah, I agree. I think everyone should have an annual evaluation. It's just a good HR practice. If it were every three years, could there be a clause or something that said if, if something was targeted, if, like you mentioned, a special plan or something they need to improve on, could it then kick into every year? Yeah. I mean, is that a possibility or? Yes, and in fact, as we provide um, more information on all the work that has gone into, even with our teachers, you'll see um, measures built into that as far as just what you're talking about, Kate. Yep. And so, uh, absolutely, I don't want anybody, and I don't feel that's the case. Uh, certainly because we have annual now, it would not be the case that we're just going to, uh, you just let two years, uh, and that's not how we, how we would go about this. But um, there's different things that through those supporting years, that you can put in place as well. And and we're doing that with our teachers as well, so. Yeah, that's why I asked that. I know that three years seems like a long time, but I also know what evaluation for teaching staff means. Every three years, there's a huge evaluation. But if a problem is identified, then every year, that problem or that issue is addressed. And that would not bother me so much because I also know it takes a lot of time to do mm -hmm. evaluations. But if, if there were um, a clause somewhere that did not let a problem not be addressed, I'd be comfortable with that either way. Okay. Gary? I think that uh, three years, two years or three years might be appropriate. And the reason I say that is <clears throat> usually the goals and tasks we have uh, that we evaluate them on aren't short-term goals, aren't short-term tasks. They're usually tasks that, that take a couple years. So maybe a full evaluation and a relook at their goals and everything might be appropriate every three years, but every year uh, take a good hard look at where they're headed toward those goals and if they're achieving those goals. Not a full evaluation, but trying to see if they're moving closer to those goals. Because I noticed that on the, we set goals from year to year. They're very, they're very, seldom, very, very seldom any, any different. They usually have the same goals for two or three or four years, and then things might change. So, set the goals for three years and evaluate them every year. See how they're how close they're getting. Because I don't think every year you're going to change goals. I don't, and part of the educator effectiveness, half of it is the goals, sorts of things, and the other half is. Uh, <coughs> building I guess for admin building administrators anyway it's how their buildings are operating and um, oh, help me out right with. well yeah you have the for the principals it would be the school learning objective which would be closely aligned with the teachers identified uh, student learning objective referred to as SLOs and so that you have that piece but then you also have the practice the professional uh, practice piece and so um, and what's included th in the professional there are 21 components that you look at uh, with and under two large domains and um, this is maybe when we're getting into a lot of detail which that may be why um, we'd be happy to give a little bit more of a information or update too to to help you look at this further so what sorts of things are included in the, the professional practice just a couple examples well as far as as far as the principal right building uh, administrator principles so the 21 components you have on the instructional side um, and I'm going to I can bring this up and we can talk you want me to do that sure because okay. I think if 
if in the off years those things were looked at and somehow and yeah. that was part I, of a I don't have a visual for you and I could That's see okay. if we can do that for you as well we can Wendy's kind of chopping a bit of yeah she is <laughs> that's okay because like you said Gary those SLO student learning objectives those kind of things as a building it's going to take time to get there but some of those other things that are you know should be happening every year that um, and it is our practice now I think to evaluate every year A couple of weeks ago, we had an orientation for our principals on this, and so as you thank you, as you sit on this monitor here, mm -hmm. it is. So the two domains that I referenced. So you have the effect. So you have under these two domains, you have then the five areas of kind of subdomains, and you can kind of see you have 21 components. And if you look at, um, you can take human resource leadership for example, and and you can look at through whether it's how we are selecting, recruiting, hiring, developing, um, and um, and going through that, you have the instructional leadership. Um, and then on the other side, the leadership actions. And you can, some of them, if you look at um, 2.1, personal behavior, um, what we'd be looking at on any of these, we'd be work, working with the, the principal, with myself, and looking at evidence and um, to really go along with each one of those components. And then you're assessing those different components. Um, so the, the part of the summary year, Part of the summary year, this is what happens that right from the start, so for example, in the coming weeks, the principal is going to identify a school learning objective and then also um, be looking at, I'm sorry, I got a, f a fly. You'd be, be looking at the different component areas as well. and. It's, and in the end, at the end of the year, we'd be rating, I would be rating those components based on the evidence that has put in, been put into the system in large part by the principal, but working with me as well. Um, so there's a, a wide range, but there's, there's, so this is that side of it um, in large part that I think what Mrs. Hancock was referring to. So this would be on the opposite side of the SLO goals. Okay, so the educator effectiveness system is built on two sides, both the practice, which represents that model that Dr. Carlson showed you with the 21 components of an effective administrator. Similar educators have 22 components that are typical of an effective educator. The second side is that outcome side that is based on the school learning objective and also then value-added reading data for elementary and middle school and high school graduation for, for a high school level until they have an assessment that will have that data, which will be shortly with the new ACT Aspire Early High School Test. Does that help? 
helps me, others. Lisa? Well, I'm still not clear. This is the off years then of the main, or is this the primary evaluation? Like the offset, because you were talking about the offset years. What's going to be the content of the offset years? It will be kind of broken down the 21 I components? think it would be both on the summative year. They would look at both the 21 plus the outcomes. And then is there a possibility to just look at the um, practice? on the off years so that it would build to having the outcomes. So can I just, so the, stu the school learning objective, each year a principal or a teacher will set a, a SLO goal. And that goal, over the three years, they will self-score, but then will be given a holistic score at the end. And that's on this, so there is that work on the off years that they are writing their school learning or student learning objectives. The other portion then is a teacher practice mm -hmm. or the principal practice in this case and that would be during their summary year there would be a formal observation but then there are many observations within that that are done on non-formal years or non-summative years. So it's not like the evaluation only happens every three years. It is ongoing, but it's really only reported at the end of three years. So if you are principal that's on a year one right now, we'll be rating that SLO. If a principal was on two years or three years, then it would be, as Wendy said, uh, uh, putting those SLOs that have been self-identified over the three-year period and then a score would be done on that summary or third year, kind of building off of those three years of the SLO. Um, I think, and as Wendy mentioned, that even in the supporting years, again, it's optional, I mean, but um, those sampling, sampling visits or those many observations can be done as well during those supporting years. So what happened if in the, you've, you've indicated they set their school learning objectives and then in the first year and second year they aren't, their school isn't making those objectives, isn't meeting those objectives. Do you wait then till the third year? I, how do you document that? So it's similar to the teacher side which they will be meeting with their evaluator at the beginning and at the end to be talking about, and even a mid-year conference, talking about how are they progressing toward their goal. They'll be collecting data along the way. So it's not waiting until the second or third year to say I'm not making my goal. You're having those check-ins periodically through the year so that at mid-year if you're falling below your goal, you know, would have a conversation, was that goal truly attainable or did you set your sights too high? Or if it is attainable, what are you going to try differently in your school or with your students to help kids reach the goals? I just have a question. Um, and I would want to word this correctly because I love our administration and what they do but the only evaluation as I understand it comes from someone above them the evaluator is their boss so to speak so a principal it might be you Dale or or whatever Correct. right but then I also wonder oftentimes about how they'd be evaluated if a staff put in evaluation um, and I don't think teacher effect well I know teacher effectiveness does not have that and yet um, that's a critical piece of how leaders lead is there I don't know I'm just throwing that out there maybe maybe it can't happen but to me is there is there a way to even if teacher effectiveness doesn't call for this, 
Would we ever get to a point in our district as if you had a business and you had department chairs and you would encourage them to ask the people that worked for them how they feel about them? Doesn't always mean you agree with everything, but you get kind of a, you get a feel for how your staff feels. Have we ever done anything like that actually, in Holman? Actually, Kate, that is part of educator effectiveness. Do, can you is, describe that for sure. me, Wendy? When, when you look at this framework, it's within the components. And if you especially look at under domain two leadership action, okay. use of feedback for improvement. So getting feedback from stakeholders is very important. So and is that like a mandated thing, or is that like if you want to get feedback, you can get it? I mean, in our district, does everybody ask for input? Um, you know, it'll look different ways. I mean, our district annual survey is a great way to get, get that feedback on how we're doing and what we could do differently. And I know currently our administrators use that at the data retreat to help guide decision making. So, and the the um, input for that feedback is from their staff. Is that what you're saying? It's from s student staff, parents, student staff, a lot of different mm -hmm. places. Thank you. I have a question for the evaluator. How much? I mean, two to three years at a time to track information, observations, you know, progress requires a lot of contact, follow through, documentation, you know, coaching, supporting. That's a lot for that evaluator to do for that span of time. And then guide that administrator or that teacher into, you know, the right path. And if they aren't self-identifying issues or they aren't self-identifying challenges, then that uh, evaluator has to have those skills to be able to facilitate that conversation is this is there training involved with like is there already so we have been working a great deal you know as administrators going to different sessions at CESA also ourselves looking at pieces of educator effectiveness looking at the requirements having the discussions on what would it look like if if this situation happens so I mean we definitely are working on that. I mean, you're right, it is pretty labor intensive. I know last year in the pilot, just the one teacher that I worked with, each time I evaluated her was an eight hour adventure. So between all the, you know, the data collection and everything that we needed to do, the pre-conference or post-conference, but the conversations with the one person that I evaluated were amazing. And, you know, I think we have to look at if you have those qualities and you have those honest conversations, they're going to help <coughs> improve pra practice and help improve student learning. And that's really the goal of educator effectiveness. It's not to rate, rank, or remove teachers. It's all about, and principals, I should say, it's all about making us better. And that relationship, I mean, you have that leader relationship, that trusting relationship. Dr. Carlson, did you? Well, I think that this is a little bit of where we're possibly gonna go at a next board meeting as far as providing an update. So Wendy and I will need to visit a little bit and how, um, yeah, and I think that would be great. I think it would be timely. What I'm sensing is that there's a feel that we not necessarily have to have that full summative based on the outcomes kind of evaluation, but that there should be something in the middle and something that's formalized and, and documented because we know from other districts that um, it's for those times when there are difficulties in areas, room for improvements yeah, to happen, right. that that's you know what really needs to be I think addressed in some of these and we hope that not to be the case but we have to watch out for those I think so yeah and, and we don't it will not be the case for our teachers either right exactly at, at that level so well I appreciate the feedback I, I think that again there are two 
uh, within the guidelines for the, as Mrs. Hancock referenced, there's two issues here, but it's perhaps difficult for the board to do one without the other. But in the end, we are recommending that those guidelines are moved to a different place, a manual, much like, and not attached to that actual policy. But because it is part of that current policy right now, and by doing that, obviously, uh, want the board to have some reaction just like you're doing now as far as how those guidelines change. And we, will, we can go through more of that because there's some additional ones that are impacted as well. Yeah, I think some of the ones that they shared with us were related to the storage of that information. And it, it, when an evaluation currently happens and what's in the policy right now is that they receive a, a paper copy. Well, under the new t ed effectiveness, there's a whole different process for that. And those are things that we understand. I think some of those that philosophically change maybe some of the beliefs that this board has is the, are the ones that we want to be right, involved right, in. Right, so. right. And that's, that was part of the purpose for today. Yeah. Good. So then the next item I think you have is the continuous improvement plan, PDSAs, which we talked about. <laughs> so included in your board packet are completed 2013-14. Um, they're really, uh, the PDSAs are the plan do study act summaries, and I would encourage you to peruse each PDSA to learn of the progress made throughout the school district and in many of our targeted growth areas. Again, um, I want to thank Wendy for the work she has done in this area, um, her guidance and support with all the PDSAs at the schools and the department levels. In fact, we're already moving into our 2014-15 cycle. As you review the PDSAs, you will know that each includes the steps of the plan, do, study, and act and the plan again is where a gap is identified in which you are wanting to address or improve um, leading to a change the this is where the goal and the approach is also identified the, after the plan the next step is due where you develop and implement an implementation plan with action steps and it's really testing that change that you're seeking and next is the study step, where data is analyzed after implementing your approach. And finally, the act phase or step is where you revise and or continue the implementation based on your data analysis. So these, the improvements are made within the action steps here. And this cycle is continuous. And as the data is analyzed and modifications made. So last year, what these plans, what these look at is uh, th over three quarters, kind of a recycling, a continuous going back and analyzing and making adjustments and modifications. <coughs> so there's a great deal of information to take in, but know that there is great work going on as we commit ourselves to this continuous improvement process in our practice in order to Number one, increase student learning in the school district and also all the other services that we provide our, our school community. So the purpose tonight is to provide you with the PDSAs that are included, uh, bringing the 2013-14 to an end. And if the board is interested in more information and presentation, be happy to do that as well. Um, again, a number of the people from the leadership team in the audience are directly involved in leading their PDSAs in their buildings or at the department level. Um, the board has started, in a sense, its own PDSA process by first identifying that goal. Uh, you looked at, with Mr. Fail, you looked at some gaps that you're wanting to try to address together. And so that's just the start. Now you have not had the opportunity yet, and that would be coming up at the next uh, development workshop, of really getting into that plan, uh, continuing and finishing that plan phase and moving into the do. So um, 
Anyway, you have a lot there to digest, and we'd be happy to present more um, in the future um, if that would be helpful for you as well. I just wondered if everybody understands the format of this, or would it be helpful if maybe he took us through one? Or would you, Kate? To go even through one is really time consuming. Mm -hmm. I'm just gonna say that. I've, I've read, I tried to read every single one because I pride myself in reading everything that comes on my agenda. But this was the most amount of documents I have ever seen. It's the <laughs> largest amount of data that I tried to digest, and I had a couple of thoughts. Um, thank you to all of you who do this. Second thought is, when you do this, what do you have to let go? <laughs> That's maybe another meeting, but the creativity and the beauty of the art of teaching and administrating, um, I cannot imagine how long it took to put these together. Um, I don't feel the need to go through them tonight because I think the public would also not benefit from that and that's often what we do as a school board. Um, so yeah, enough said without being redundant. I'm grateful for what teachers and administrators mm -hmm. need to do right now with this. The whole concept of, of um, PDSA is incredible, but when I try to read it, and I'm a speed reader, <laughs> I've spent probably 24 hours reading every single word that each of you put into that. Um, I did see some patterns, which maybe, maybe as a school board, I don't know, and maybe even for our administrators, is there any way it could be shortened up to just get to the heart of the matter? So for example, one school identified that while our econ economic, um, economic, um, thank you, <laughs> those, those kids are hurting and we're not addressing that yet. So that's what I wanna know as a school board and I'm guessing that's what teachers wanna know and administrators want to know, and if, but the charts were, you, you know, if you've read them, you know what I'm talking about. And I want to do a really good job. <laughs> I want to read every single thing, but I can't, um, it was like too much for me. It was an overload. Yeah, just one was 41 pages all by itself. I think the biggest one I saw was 54. Yeah. <laughs> And it, I'm not, I don't mean to belittle it or make fun of it. I'm so proud of all the hard work that everyone has done because they have to do that. And yet, ultimately, data or testing or anything else has to come back to why do I need it? If there's something I need to know, get to the heart of the matter. And I bet it's not just me that feels that way. And uh, how much of this are people's hands tied? So they have to do that? Or do our people have choices? I don't know. Administrators, maybe they have some thoughts. Um, but It does make me think back to uh, maybe a year or so ago when we were talking about a data person mm -hmm. that you, know, you talked about what is collecting all of this information taking away from. And it, mm -hmm. I suspect if it our staff who are in the classroom, who are administrators that have other roles and responsibilities are taking time to put this, are having to put this together. It's gotta to take away, as you said, from some of the things they I do. I think so. so, and for every administrator that gathers that and all the help they get, there are under each administrator 30 to 40 teachers who are donating hours and hours, punching numbers into a computer and what can't they do because of that and again I go back to our hands tied but it worries me it worries me a lot we, there was an article in La Crosse Tribune about maybe you can help me a student from Holman who went to London oh yeah um, Taylor Peterson that's it and 
the London educators said to her, you know the problem with American students is they have lost their creativity. They're so used to being told exactly what to do. We don't do that over here. Yeah. yeah. So I'll be quiet so, now. But <laughs> any other comments or questions? Okay. Thank you. And then um, the highway HD spin, speed limit. You may have seen that. We've communicated that, but you've also perhaps seen it in the Courier Life. In recent weeks, we've had discussion with the village of Holman regarding a number of issues, and I know Dr. Trunstead she was is here. She um, and we've been working, I approached the Chief McHugh at the village as well, and there's a couple issues and concerns, but quite honestly, the speed limit continues to be something that we have an interest in as a school district. This is nothing new when Prairie View was built. We had uh, a lot of discussion and work with both the county and the village, and in part, much of that led to what you do see out there, uh, which are advisory speed limit signs and the crossing walk and so on. So uh, the village of Holman Police Chief Mike McHugh has communicated with the highway commissioner requesting consideration for the speed limit to be lowered in that area. In addition, the Holman Village Board, you may have seen, recently approved a resolution asking the county to partner with the village to change the speed limit on that section of roadway. So um, I thought it was timely to bring it to the board's attention here, looking for any direction based on what we know at this time of what the correspondence or the decisions that have been made by the village. Um, in the past, we've, we have felt uh, as a partner uh, with this type of issue going back to when Prairie View was built. But we don't have a lot of information yet, such as what are the next steps, what kind of study must be done, uh, co related costs, and so on. Um, but I am looking for direction from the board at this time. If, if, you're, if you'd be interested in looking at some possibilities of either direct administration or assign it to the appropriate committee, which probably would be buildings and grounds. Um, so tonight it's an awareness and looking for if, if there is any direction at this point. If not, we can bring it back and see how, where, uh, what happens between with the village and the county as well. Do you think assigning it to a committee, I mean, what are we looking for? Are we looking just for adaptation or support of the reduction of the speed limit? I know my conversation with Chief McHugh is that, you know, Obviously, this, this has been an interest of the school district since it was built and uh, since Prairie View was built. And would there be continued interest? And if so, perhaps uh, additional I mean, resolution or communication with the county as far as a belief by the school district uh, making a change in the speed limit. So other than that, I'm not, I guess I'm not prepared to say tonight specific steps but would there be an interest uh, for the board to make some kind of statement or do some kind of work? Because I think didn't, the village did approve a resolution yes. of reducing it. So, um, you know, we could send it to the Buildings and Grounds Committee, but I suspect if we all support reducing it, we could at the next meeting approve a resolution saying that. I don't know that it has to be studied or anything, but um, I would hate to delay it, delay that kind of, I think right I, now I'm seeing. I would agree. I think, you know, if administration could just come with a resolution for the next meeting, I certainly would support that. Mm -hmm. And I, yeah, I think there's a consensus by the board that I'm seeing the head shaking that mm -hmm. we would support the village's um, resolution as well. And if we need to do an official one, we can do that. But also I think if we could know who we might want to reach out to individually um, as a board too to the county board members we certainly could reach out to those folks that serve on that commission and ask them for their consideration i think board members would be willing to do that as well okay and like i said we don't know we don't have all the information as far as what are the going to be the steps and costs related to studying this and so on but uh, we could perhaps craft something to bring back okay. to the board Okay. Great. Thank you. That's it 
for my report at this point. Okay, then moving on to reports and discussion. Parent transportation contracts. Beth. <clears throat> Waiting patiently. <laughs> Good evening. Good which evening. I don't know which one you have first, but I only have <clears throat> two. And these are ongoing that we've had year after year, same families. Nothing has changed with the cost or how much it's going to come to, except for we do it on attendance of the children. So we take attendance, and then that's how we pay them. So these are the two I have. One is for a child going to Onalaska for $360, and one is for a high school student that goes to a special ed school in La Crosse for a total if they attend every day of two thousand one hundred and sixty dollars I don't see these aren't on the consent agenda but they would be on next weeks or Correct. the next board meetings so if you have any questions statutorily we can either transport them or provide for a parent contract right, which so. is yeah so this is the most economic way to do it okay thank you Beth thank you good evening then staffing increase recommendations, Dr. Carlson. You have a number of items under this section, and if I could just quickly, I'll go through each one, and if you have questions, we have listed them separately so that each one has a separate issue paper. We are asking, as we are asking for consideration this evening um, mm -hmm. on these positions, but again, we've listed them separately in case you have uh, specific questions on, on one versus the other. First of all, for uh, we have a recommendation for a 1.0 FTE ESL teacher uh, in recent weeks. Um, we've experienced an increase in the number of students eligible to receive ESL services, and so Julie Krakow is, is requesting an addition, additional 1.0 FTE position. We believe at this time we we're looking more towards a one-year limited so that we can further study this um, and so that's that's what's being requested under that item I can go through each one and then come back and take questions if you have questions on that the next one is a seven hour per day special education educational assistant at the middle school due to an increase in students identified for high levels of support again julie is requesting an additional seven hour per day educational assistant for the middle school and that cost is estimated at uh, twenty thousand five hundred dollars we have a four hour per day health office educational assistant at viking in order to provide each health office with coverage for the entire school day it is proposed to add a one four hour per day health educational assistant at Viking Elementary. This request is the result of further work done by Pupil Services Director Julie Krakow with our school nurses and our principals, primarily at the elementary level, where a decision was made to move forward with reposting and moving forward with securing another uh, nursing position with the intention uh, then of maintaining a district nursing staff of five registered nurses and we are hopeful actually in speaking with julie today we're hopeful that we are we can bring a nurse recommendation to the board at our next board meeting so but this is something that um, we feel is necessary to bring on at viking um, most urgently and so that we can be ready for the start of the school year uh, next is um, for the high school a, a 0 0.17 FTE and just to tell you what that really means uh, it would be over the course of two terms at the high school for those 90 minute blocks for two terms first se first and second term and so principal Bob Bear is requesting this staffing increase for the high school in order to accommodate staffing for what's ultimately ending up being is our SEEDS course. A number of you have perhaps had the privilege of even watching our students as far as the skits and so on. And that's a, a course that meets terms one and two. And uh, we're looking for, we have a teacher who is ready to do, and this would be an overload. 
uh, teacher that is prepared to do that. Uh, some of our scheduling with our English, English language arts department over the weeks and months has resulted in this need. And so uh, the cost is estimated at about $10,000. And then finally, um, elementary staffing. Things continue to evolve, continue to change. We are, I think, um, holding right now still at 79 sections. But we have two areas. Uh, now, at the last board meeting, the board approved the same recommendation, and that moved it to 80 sections, but we have not acted on that yet. This would be actually an, an additional one, so it would move us to give us the flexibility of actually moving to 81 sections if needed in our remaining days and weeks. So we currently have two areas that are really at capacity or close. The principals are working um, on those, and this would allow administration the flexibility of to move in a more timely manner. But that is a little bit of an update. Again, um, you approved at the last board meeting to add an <coughs> 80th section. We technically currently right now are scheduled for 79, but I am concerned that we have two areas that we are going to have to closely watch, if not by the start, even through September. And so um, this would give us that flexibility. I believe I finished the list. I'd be happy yeah, to take questions did. on any of those, but these are part of the consent this evening. Any questions? Yeah, with the elementary, um, Dr. Carlson, if, <clears throat> if limits aren't met and another position is not put in, but then limits are exceeded in a month, does that mean that classrooms will be split up? <clears throat> then a new teacher is hired and kids go to different places? I'm guessing the answer to that is yes. And so I bring that up because that's a concern to me. Um, I, I know it's a lot of money. I, I do get that. And yet, that's my question. Your policy, your administrative rule talks about, again, that capacity of for, um, I don't know if it's formally up, but it, because of the board's action, K, pre-K through 3, 27, and then 4 and 5, 30, uh, capacity of 30. And anything over 30 or 27, we would then need to put in place some additional support or staffing. I say that because it could possibly take the look, uh, some different looks. But the reality would be, most likely moving to some kind of additional staffing or support. I'm not, we've done, this rarely has happened, but the few occasions, I know we have few principals out there that have experienced this, and in my short tenure we have worked through this. We've, we've looked at some creative ways um, to bring more staff support, and it may not necessarily result in actually splitting a class. Um, so there are some possibilities, but in the end, we would be looking to do something to provide um, additional support for that classroom teacher and to our students. So, but yes, Ms. Mayor, this could occur after the start of the school year. Yeah, and that's- and Again, I'm still concerned about 30 kids in elementary classrooms. I'm really, really concerned. And I know SALC will be looking at that and right. talking about it. Um, but it's all about the kids for me and the high stakes that our kids have, our administrators have, our teachers have, even 29 kids is a lot in third grade. <laughs> it's a huge, it's a huge thing. So additional support staff is wonderful, but it's not as good as a smaller class size. And I think in the past, we've really looked at the principal working with staff and making the best decision as a whole for those students. Because you bring up uh, as a challenging situation after the school year started and, 
and really looking at changing the dynamics of a classroom after those relationships have already started to be formed. And so it's a balance. And I know our, our principals have, they're, uh, they're very sensitive to that as well. Any other questions? I am curious about the um, health educational assistant. You mentioned that we are moving forward with the five RNs. In the past, have we had a RN in every elementary? We have in the past. I want to say, are we looking at three years ago? I think that's been our goal, though, hasn't it, to, but because of. <clears throat> and we're, we're, in, and we're encouraged now to be, we had some, I think, some very successful interviews and to bring us to that um, fifth. Last year, we had, through substitutes, we maintained, you know, much of the year a fifth nurse uh, staffing, I believe, if that's correct. And so we're looking forward to hopefully bringing on someone permanently. But would you do five or would you do six? Would you look at six? We've got six buildings and, well, we've got seven buildings. Well, we're currently looking at five to achieve five. So we would have not one at elevate. How would we split? We have one at the middle school, one at the high school, and then the three would be split Correct. And amongst the four elementaries. And probably for the past at least two years, if not three years, we've, I think two years, um, Viking and Sand Lake have shared, correct? And so, um, and so that's where, and we already have some additional uh, educational assistant hours at Sand Lake and we'd be looking for Viking in this case. So we have been doing this for at least two years as far as the sharing between uh, Viking and Sand Lake. Okay. But would our, because I'm asking, would our goal be to have an RN at every elementary? And we have, we have been making do, I think is what I've heard, because we haven't been able to recruit and so, you know, I'm just wondering if what's the goal? Is the goal just to have five or is it to have one at every elementary? Well, we can, if, again, we've been operating under one and two staff at this point to make sure we can staff five and then look at a, how that plan evolves. We can come back and present further and get on that if, if that's what the board is looking for well that'd be fine I, I was just I mean right, I was, right now we we're, we're staffing we're trying to achieve a staffing of five nurses okay okay and um, are there comparables with other districts and what the goal is I mean when you talk to um, health professionals um, the same way we look at teacher effectiveness or any other effectiveness what does the health profession say with schools in terms of from everything from liability to helping our kids? I mean, I don't know. That's yes, not we, we right can. Now. We have the comparable information. And okay. We do we, have We, we, do we have, have comparable information, I believe, Julie, and we can, we can certainly provide that. Absolutely. Yeah, but we don't know what that is just right now, not yet. I don't, I don't have that that's right okay. here. Yeah, right I know, here. that was a surprise question. So. Oh, that's okay. Um, all right, thanks. Well, we, we certainly have that, we can provide that. Okay. And then, so then moving on, Dr. Carlson, Health Office Educational Assistant Wage Differential. <clears throat> you have an issue paper that talks about um, it's the administration's recommendation to make an adjustment in the per hour wage for the health office educational assistant position. This has been something that we've been discussing for multiple years. Um, we believe that there are elements of this position that equal, at least equal, the uniqueness 
that our special education educational assistance experience both in the classroom and through our transportation and then also our library media centers eas and so this would this adjustment would bring our health office educational assistance on par with those other areas and we think that it's time to do that and appropriate so that would be our recommendation that is at a cost of approximately about sixteen hundred dollars okay questions okay then moving on to 2014-2015 proposed budget approval mr miller <clears throat> there we go. Just had a delay. Thank you. Um, item 10.4 is the proposed 2014 proposed budget, 15 <clears throat> proposed budget. And you have three documents, um, the first of which is the budget memo spreadsheet. And could you speak into the microphone? Sure. Thank um, you. The budget memo spreadsheet is one of the documents related to the budget. You also have a budget memo um, narrative prepared by Dr. Carlson, which gives a um, description of what these uh, changes are to the budget. But the budget memo spreadsheet um, strives to identify the changes from the prior year. And I, I thought I'd walk you through the, uh, the sections. Am, is it, am I talking loud enough now? Mm -hmm. okay, yes, good. thank you. All right. Um, First of all, the revenue sources um, through the equalized aid and tax levy driven by enrollment uh, trends uh, looks at an increase of $1.2 million. And then the other major category is a change in the state aid that what they call categorical aid uh, going from $75 to $150 for this year would be providing an additional $302,000 for a total of $1,467,000. The expenditures uh, are largely identified in the uh, budget memo document prepared by Dr. Carlson and also detailed uh, in the meeting tonight. Um, each of these items is identified by the uh, board meeting date that they were presented, uh, as well as the changes to salaries and benefits, uh, increases in uh, wages, uh, health insurance, and those kinds of things, the open enrollment tuition, insurance, and so forth. The rest are um, employment um, related changes and that uh, at, uh, totals 1.5 million 1580 and Ben on the board you'll note oh Ben if you could just go back sure. those last few items on that pertain to what's being actually presented tonight um, so you'll see those I did go ahead and put those on um, I'm beginning with uh, I think you see the ESL teacher and working on your way down. From there, we talk about the changes to the um, program areas. And as in the past, there are some ongoing and some one-time uh, increases. And then um, also discontinued would be that one time from the prior year. This brings it down to a projected budget balance of uh, the expenses out compared to the revenues increase of a negative $98,000. That's following a budget surplus for the 2013-14 year. The two years combined will be a net uh, increase to uh, the budget uh, balance. And so I also wanted to see, show you how that ties out to the, the DPI proposed budget. I won't go into all the numbers on that but uh, there's four pages of numbers but I did want to point out a couple of lines that you uh, you'll be able to tie out with this first document the total uh, expenditures I'm sorry the total revenues on line 57 for the general fund is the uh, 42 million 921 and the expenses for again for general fund total is just over 43 million and that nets out to that ninety eight thousand dollar amount that I described before and so the the line items of that budget reflect the changes that you saw in that budget memo spreadsheet all of the changes the pluses or the minuses were applied to uh, the overall budget hopefully that makes it a little easier to understand all, how all those numbers tie together the um, 
So that's the proposed budget approval. Um, I don't know if there's any questions on that. Uh, there's another item kind of related to a 10.5. It's the 2015-16 budget. It's a, a budget gap analysis that, we, that we've done. And this somewhat answers the question of, of whether this, um, this spending is sustainable. And what that, what that report shows is that, and I don't have that displayed up here, but I can, I can give you the highlights, is that the, due to expected trending in enrollment, that the revenue source increase will continue. Uh, continuing these expenses as well as um, um, any other changes that we see in that next year, we would still have projected available resources of over $300,000 in addition to what is, is being uh, presented here tonight. So that is the 2015-16, what we refer to as budget gap. And it's, it's a projection. And does that include the one-time allocations for this year? Or the, does not include that? The, it, it, it takes into account removing the one-time right. allocations, okay. Thank you. but not adding them back. Thank you. The next item is the um, criteria for, I don't, I don't know if there's any questions before we move on to the next Any question. questions? OK. Mr. Clark is going to be going uh, over this item, the criteria for funding determination. So you received in your, um, let's take me a second here to, you received in your board packet a draft issue paper. Uh, it's shown as a report and discussion item on uh, tonight's agenda. Um, it deals with the <clears throat> criteria used for making funding decisions, and this will be for the 2015-16 budget. <clears throat> Mr. Miller's presenting to you information on the budget year we're in right now, 14-15, and the uh, budget calendar that the board approved um, Includes some early work at this time, um, more than, um, well, we'll start next July, but uh, uh, we're way out in front. But these are the funding criteria. Criteria used to determine uh, how any resources that are available will be applied to meet the long list of uh, needs that the district has. What you see on the screen right now are the criteria that were used last year uh, in the 14-15 budget making uh, decisions. Um, at that point in time, there were seven criteria. I've also provided for you a copy of a revised set of criteria uh, for the upcoming 15-16 uh, year. And um, there again are seven criteria. They um, drifted over onto two pages as opposed to one page last year. And I wanted to point out some of the major changes. Major changes included uh, making sure that the board approved focus areas um, were part of the decision making criteria. So if you remember uh, two years ago, we had strategic objectives, four strategic objectives, and we made budgeting decisions aligned with those four board strategic objectives. The board has since moved to six focus areas. And we thought it appropriate that uh, we made sure that the criteria used to determine what gets funding matches up with the focus areas that the board has. So that was one of the changes. Um, there's a removal of a criteria called essential departmental services. Um, we believe that that is addressed most specifically in the board focus area of customer and stakeholder focus. So as we looked at our old description of essential departmental services, we thought it was so close to customer stakeholder focus that uh, it was no longer needed. We removed mandates from the criteria. Uh, the input that we received from the leadership team members indicated that uh, scoring a mandate um, made little sense. If it's a mandate, it's a mandate. What's the point of scoring? Um, so uh, we created a more complete description of what a mandate uh, was and was not 
and if it is truly meeting this mandate definition, um, it won't be necessary to score it. It's actually a mandate. And then um, we wrote some descriptions of how to deal with overall scoring for a criteria because some of the criteria have multiple measures. There's multiple factors to consider within the criteria. And what if it really matches up with well with one of the measures but doesn't quite specifically address one or two of the other measures within that criteria. So the question was, well, how do you weigh that out um, when it meets one and not others? And those are outlined for you in the issue paper. Um, these have, um, we, sh we visited with the leadership team on the August 13th uh, meeting talking about the direction we were taking with the criteria as we were uh, seeking input from the leadership team prior to coming to the board. This would be up for board action at the next board meeting. Are there any questions? Any questions? Okay, thank you. Switch chairs again. Then the next 10.7, we're down to final, final revisions for 2013-14. Yes. So this is a, a requested final revision to the 2013-14 budget. Um, this does represent um, a timing difference. And um, our, you know our practice has been to uh, present the final revision in June. Um, but we learned recently that many other schools are taking advantage of the fact that the DPI allows uh, budget revisions in this late in the year. And in fact, um, the state looks at um, variances in a negative light and our, our ratings uh, for our bond ratings looks at variances in a negative light. So we want to put our, our school district on the same ground, uh, fair ground as other school districts and take the opportunity to make these revisions and, and balance them, so to speak, with, uh, with the, uh, what the numbers that we now know and so um, to revise those. And so we're asking to accept this final revision, which would then be, become our, our final, uh, our, our official final. Any questions? Are there any questions? It was interesting to read that, that other districts do that, but we were not, and this will help us out. So thank you for your work. It is interesting, because usually tonight is the night we're voting on next year's budget and all of that good stuff, so. Um, but it's okay. said in here you could do it up yep. until August, and we're still in August, so you're good. <laughs> good. Okay, and then 10 point, let me get to my agenda. Um, 10.8, advanced purchase of desktop computers. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Dr. Carlson. Yeah, we, the board's asked to consider approval of a recommendation to not reduce the instructional technology budget for the 2014 school year as originally presented and approved by the board back in May. You may recall that um, the board approved an advanced purchase back in May. Um, this, as far as, in, that was in about an amount of 200, a little over $200,000. There was also an amount of oh, about I want eighty some thousand dollars from this from the sinking fund too. But what we're really talking about here is right out of directly Jan's um, operational budget that she has available. And so the recommendation is based on, <clears throat> as Mr. Miller kind of referenced, the final audit results for the 2013-14 fiscal year, identifying a surplus amount that would allow for the avoidance of the reduction adjustment to the IT budget as a result of the advanced purchase. Allowing for us to maintain these dollars in our IT budget will enable us to immediately work on replacing our most aged computer labs, also continue supporting our digital transition teacher development and expand the deployment, continuing to look at expanding the deployment of our mobile devices. So um, I do not have this on the consent for tonight. We have it on the consent for the next board meeting in two weeks, but we are strongly recommending to the board. We feel budget-wise we're, we're in good shape and can um, recommend the board and make this recommendation to the board. So if you have questions on this, 
Otherwise, we will be coming back to the board at the next one asking for approval. Any questions on this? Okay, no questions. Then the agenda re